Oh, you do have it. All right, good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Senate Banking and Financial Institutions Committee, and I thank everybody for being here today. Um, this is very exciting for me because a couple of years ago I was able to work on what we now call the Homeowners Bill of Rights, <coughs> which was a joint effort between the Senate and the Assembly, and uh, it was the first piece of legislation of its kind in the nation that set some ground rules protecting borrowers uh, who are in foreclosure processes. And I apologize for my voice. Um, I have been suffering with a, an upper respiratory infection for the last two weeks. And I'm grateful to be able to speak and sit upright, but uh, please bear with me because my voice is not real strong right now. I'd like to um, say a very special welcome to Assemblymember Mariko Yamada, who has joined us here today. She represents the 4th Assembly District immediately east of us. Um, these chambers are particularly significant to me. I attended many city council meetings and planning commission meetings here during my 11-year tenure um, in local government, and so it's a real pleasure to be here again today. Um, before we take a look at where things stand right now, I'd like to take a few minutes just to look at where we were just a few short years ago. Um, all of us remember 2004 and 2005. California's housing market seemed invincible and the American dream appeared achievable for people who never imagined they'd ever be able to own a home. But in 2007, after several boom years, the first cracks became visible. That year, 280,000 notices of default were reported by lenders and close to 100,000 homes were foreclosed upon. In 2008, close to half a million notices of default were reported, and over a quarter of a million homes were lost to foreclosure. Seriously, it was a tsunami. The problem started with the housing market, but quickly spread to the broader economy. In October 2008, Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy and sent the stock market into freefall. Millions of people watched their savings and retirement accounts disappear almost overnight and tens of thousands of people lost their jobs. And coincidentally, a month later, I took over as the chair of the Assembly Budget Committee, uh, and our state's economy was in free fall. By August of 2009, Californians' unemployment rate was 12.2%, highest level since 1940, and the state budget was $20 billion out of balance. We had lost close to 50, <coughs> excuse me, close to 20% of our expected revenues in the state. We had to cut vital state services and vulnerable populations in our state were deeply affected. What began as a mortgage crisis evolved into a statewide and actually an international economic crisis that has touched all of us in some way. We also began hearing from borrowers who had reached out to their lenders asking for help with mortgages that had become unaffordable. Those borrowers had done the right thing and contacted their servicers seeking help only to be treated terribly. Borrowers were misled, placed on hold, disconnected, sent to voicemail boxes that were too full to accept messages, given conflicting information, and required to send in multiple copies of the same document. <clears throat> Some borrowers were foreclosed upon while actively negotiating loan modifications. Others were foreclosed upon while making payments on mortgages their lenders had agreed to modify. The list of problems was never ending. The legislature tried but failed several times in 2010 and 2011 to enact mortgage servicing reforms. In 2012, it was finally became clear to everybody we had to act. From 2007 to 2011, over 1.8 million notices of default had been recorded on California properties. Over 900,000 homes had been foreclosed upon. I was happy to be named chair of a two-house legislative conference committee tasked with reaching an agreement on legislation that had failed during the two prior years. And that legislation, Senate Bill 900 and Assembly Bill 278, is the reason that we're here today. When we wrote the Homeowner's Bill of Rights, we set out to fix a broken process. We tried to give each borrower a single point of contact, give borrowers answers on their loan modification applications within reasonable time frames, require that loan modification offers be put in writing, 
put an end to dual tracking, and put an end to robo-signing in California. We gave borrowers and state regulators enforcement powers. And so today, what, a year and a half later, we're here to find out how things are going. Foreclosure filings are down significantly, and the housing market in California appears to be roaring back. <laughs> But I also know from experience uh, and hearing from my constituents that some borrowers are still getting the runaround from servicers and some attorneys are refusing to challenge servicers on borrowers' behalf. We continue to hear problems about loan documentation, mortgage documentation, and even fraud, as well as ongoing problems with the Mortgage Electronic Registration System, or MERS, which our homeowners' bill of rights could not address. So things are better, but they're not perfect. I'm very interested to hear from all of our witnesses today about what's working and what's not working, what's been done, and what next needs to be done. I'll be leaving office at the end of this year, but the information we learn today can inform my colleagues about the next steps that can and should be taken moving forward. And with that, I will ask uh, Assemblymember Yamada if she has anything to add. Thank you very much, Senator Evans. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you very much for extending this invitation uh, for me to join you today. I do represent a portion of Sonoma County, the Sonoma Valley, and Roner Park. Uh, but I uh, want to uh, certainly uh, applaud Senator Evans' leadership. Uh, she was my budget chair during those uh, first very difficult years uh, when I was sworn in uh, to the assembly. <coughs> Sometimes I say we get sworn in to get sweared at. But um, uh, it was a very difficult time to uh, be a freshman legislator uh, being sworn in and then essentially being faced with these massive crushing deficits that had to be dealt with. Uh, I think that through this process we know that uh, so many hardships were endured. Uh, but we are in a, a little bit better shape now, and it's really important to uh, take a look back at the work that has been done to see uh, what's worked and what hasn't. Uh, I also wanted to be here because Assemblymember Mike Eng, who was then uh, banking uh, chair, uh, also did so much work together with Senator Evans. and. Uh, I just actually uh, texted him a snapshot of today's agenda. He's down in Los Angeles and uh, just said, you know, your work carries on. Uh, I too will be leaving uh, the assembly at the end of this year, uh, but I know that just as my message to Mr. Eng uh, reflects, uh, the work that we have done, we hope, will continue to be of benefit and uh, there's still uh, room for more work in the future. So I want to thank Senator Evans. I think the last time I was here with you, uh, it was uh, for the Select Committee on Wine. I also chaired the Select Committee on Sustainable and Organic Ag. So maybe the Committee on Wine, I always say, is the happiest committee uh, in the legislature. But um, I think uh, banking and financial uh, institution issues are also very, very important. And uh, let's see what we can learn today. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So with that, we will call up our first speaker, Madeline Schnapp, the Director of Economics Research Property Radar. So um, we are going to have a slideshow, I think. Yeah, and we'll welcome. Have a, a slideshow and a talk about the uh, foreclosure market and the housing market and how that all ties together. Um, I'm the Director of Economic Search with uh, Research with Property Radar. Property Radar is a California property data analytics firm. Um, that gathers public record data from all the counties to determine um, various sorts of trends and facts. And what I do is, is aggregate and interpret that data and provide reporting on the California property market. And it almost happens in real time. So as soon as, as, soon as the data is recorded at the public recorder's office, or the county recorder's office, we get that data and then uh, craft reports out of it. So I want to thank you, Noreen, for having this opportunity to present to you uh, about the California property market. I want to thank Eileen Newell, who uh, extended the invitation to myself and my firm. So um, uh, we'll get started. So the first slide, please. All right, we're going to start by taking a look at the foreclosure market in, uh, in California. Um, uh, take a look at the trends, some of the important um, legislative achievements by California and the Homeowners Bill of Rights. And then we'll take a look at uh, a brief look at Sonoma County and where we are with the uh, foreclosure process in Sonoma County. Then kind of switch to the broader California um, housing market briefly, take a look at that. 
where we are uh, in terms of sales and median prices and how we're faring with negative equity. All right, so the foreclosure uh, crisis really began um, uh, with the peaking of the housing market in the summer of 2005 and 2006, and foreclosures really began to take off in 2007 and really caught everybody by surprise. I don't think a lot of people knew. Uh, they, they knew that, uh, uh, that the housing market was probably unsustainable. They had no idea the size of, of the foreclosure uh, process. So through, through 2007, foreclosures um, in, increased dramatically, and then uh, notices of, of default actually peaked at 60,000 per month um, in, uh, uh, in 2008 and 2009. Um, California uh, SB 1137, which uh, required banks to provide notification to homeowners, um, dramatically slowed the foreclosure process um, until September of 2008, when the whole uh, finance industry went into cardiac arrest with the collapse of Lehman Brothers, Fannie and Mae and Freddie Mac going into receivership. And that culminated in uh, what looked like might have been a near economic collapse for the entire you know, US economy. So uh, TARP was instituted, which provided banks breathing room to um, reorganize, reorganize themselves. Um, foreclosures stopped right at that uh, 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 right at that moment, pretty much ground to a halt, as banks tried to figure out what these properties were all worth. And clearly they weren't worth what, uh, what they were at the peak, but what were they, uh, what were they worth? So um, TARP allowed them some breathing room to reorganize themselves in preparation for dealing with this massive, uh, massive crisis. Uh, the foreclosure crisis peaked. Uh, peaked in um, uh, March of 2009, I said it's 60,000 per month. Now it's about 6,000 per, per month. So in the previous five years, we've made dramatic strides towards correcting, uh, correcting that problem and allowing the California housing market um, to uh, march down its path of recovery. Notice of trustee sales peaked in May of 2009 at 45,000 per month, also now at about 6,000 per month, a dramatic decrease. Um, and even today, notices of default and notices of trustee sale are down 23% and 41% year over year. So we're still sort of um, um, heading back to some sort of sense of normalcy. Um, notices of default, notices of trustee sale are actually lower than they have been since our records began in 2007. So we're not quite where we would call normal, but we're, which would be around 5,000 notices per month or so, somewhere around that range but we're certainly heading in that direction. And a lot of government programs have allowed homeowners the breathing room to be able to restructure their finances and make prog progress to towards keeping, keeping their homes. So on November 2012, we recorded our millionth foreclosure sale in California. That was an amazing, uh, a pretty amazing milestone, certainly unprecedented in, in history. Um, so where we see a lot of the um, uh, government policies, the impact of the government policies, we'll see in the next slide. So if you can change the slide. The next slide is a, um, a, a graph of trustee sales, those are the red bars, and the line is the time to foreclose. Now before going into the foreclosure crisis, prices, the time to foreclose was about 120 days. There's three stages, there's notices of default, notice of trustee sale, and finally culminating in a foreclosure sale at the courthouse steps. That used to take about 120 days. Well, as soon as California passed SB 1137, which required notifications, um, the time to foreclose began to increase, which was allowing people time to sort of get their finances in order after receiving a shock of the fact that their home was now worth half of what it was before the prices, through no fault of their own. Um, uh, as soon as TARP was rolled out, the federal government began to roll out a plethora of, of uh, mortgage modification programs, the homeowner modification program, the homeowner refinance program, um, FHA had, had many programs. And depending on who financed your loan, whether it was fi uh, fi Fannie or Freddie that held your loan or a bank that held your loan, that allowed had homeowners another sort of option 
other than foreclosure to be able to um, reorganize their finances. And along, so uh, the time to foreclose increased again, averaging about 200, uh, 200 a month through the end of about 2009. So as time, uh, as time went on, the time to foreclose continued to in increase until we hit the robo-signing moratoriums in which um, it was found uh, banks, were fair, banks and mortgage servicing companies were just signing, you know, illegally signing paperwork to foreclose on people. So the time to foreclose basically more or less increased until banks were sort of straightened out that whole process and then the MERS, you know, who owns the loans, and, which was uncertain. Um, on the heels of that, in, in probably January 2012, banks were able to reactivate their foreclosure process. The time to foreclose decreased to about 250 days and then began to increase, um, increase again. And along came the Homeowner's Bill of Rights, in, in which went into, um, went into effect in January of 2013. And um, um, the reason we had a pretty big decrease in the time to foreclose is banks were really trying to get their foreclosures through the pipeline as quickly as possible before they had to comply with that law. Um, so as soon as that was passed, the time to foreclose increased again to over 350 days. Now we're looking at about a year um, from start to finish um, until the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency Letter uh, appeared in May 2013, which basically said, look, you need to really, really be sure that your foreclosure procedures are, um, are, you know, you're crossing every T, uh, dotting every I before otherwise there's going to be significant penalties. And so that brings us to today. The time to foreclose is about 300 days. But you realize now that your foreclosure sales are about 90% lower than they were at the peak. So we're looking at uh, a, a market that is almost back to normal. And I, I would think that at the current rate of foreclosures, we'll probably be someplace back to where we started in, in the foreclosure you know, process, back to where we started what is in you know, some sense of normal probably sometime in the middle of next year. So that's a, so, so we're finally on the other side of this foreclosure nightmare and able to sort of uh, uh, move forward in a more normal housing, housing market. So in the next slide, we take a look at, one of the interesting things I discovered is that depending on the size of your loan, whether it was uh, under 417,000 in between 417,000 and 550,000 or greater than 550,000, your time to foreclose ranged from about 300 days for a conforming loan less than 417,000 to almost 600 days if your mortgage was over 550,000. Now why was that? And um, the reason is, is that a larger loan sometimes had more than one mortgage. And so you're dealing with multiple, multiple financing, financing sources. But also, I, I have to tend to believe that banks were reticent about taking a larger hit as opposed to taking the smaller hit. So um, as time goes forward and this foreclosure process sort of resolves itself, you know, this, this sort of disparity that we're seeing in the marketplace will probably be, be a thing of history. So now we'll take a quick look at the Sonoma County marketplace. The Sonoma County marketplace mirrors the, uh, the overall California marketplace. Um, foreclosures peaked in August of 2009 then have come down dramatically. They peaked at about 600 per month and now we're looking at uh, foreclosures on the order of 60 to 70, uh, 70 per month, certainly far lower. Not quite back into the normal range, we're looking at about 50 per month for a normalcy, but certainly a lot better. And the Homeowner's Bill of Rights, there you can see where it, it, it came in. Um, provided an alternative for ho homeowners to, um, uh, you know, really take a look at short sales and gave them time to sort of evaluate those sorts of things as opposed to a bank dual tracking where they would put people in the foreclosure process while allowing a short sale. And that really um, put a lot of pressure on the homeowner that didn't necessarily need to be there. So that was, you know, that, that was a, a definite benefit of that particular bill. So uh, next slide shows the t uh, trustee sales and time to foreclose. Um, in uh, Sonoma County, we're looking at uh, trustee sales now in the 20 to 30 per month range, uh, down from a peak of 350. So this county, even though it has a higher median income, let's say the central part of California, was really hit pretty hard by, uh, by the foreclosure crisis. And that's certainly, most of that is certainly behind us. 
Um, you can see the Homeowner Bill of Rights um, uh, increase the time to foreclose, giving homeowners time to sort of um, reevaluate some of their options, perhaps pursue a short sale more aggressively without having to worry about losing their home in foreclosure. So you can see that process. So how does this tie into the larger housing market? The next slide will take a look at where we are in California sales. The red bars are distressed sales, and the blue bars are non-distressed sales. And you can see that as a percentage of total sales, distressed sales were about 60% of total market sales in, uh, throughout most of 2009. That's pretty amazing. We've never seen that before in the history of our housing market. So fast forward to today, where it's almost the reverse. Distressed sales are about 25% of the market, and non-distressed sales are about 70, 78 to almost 80% of the market. Can I stop you and ask a question? Yeah. Um, as many have heard here, I actually lost my home in this whole crisis, okay. but <clears throat> I was able to sell it once the market started coming back um, for almost exactly what I owed. So it wasn't a short sale, it wasn't a foreclosure. Yeah. Um, and I would have considered my situation as distressed, <laughs> but it wouldn't show up in your non-distressed property sales, so, or in your distressed property figures here. So how are you defining distressed property sales? Distressed property sales are a bank REO resale. So a bank okay. takes a property back at the auction and then sells it into the market. Um, so, and then the other component of that is short sales. So we define distressed sales as a sum of REO, bank REO resales plus short sales. Okay. And distress sales, non-distress sales are everything else. Yeah, so um, it's slightly understating, at least from my personal experience, what actually, it, it doesn't take into account those homeowners who are forced to, sale, to sell, even if they can no. sell at market rate. You know, this is, this is you know, uh, county record data, so there's no way mm -hmm. that we can kind of sort that, okay. sort that out. But yes, right. Thank you. Um, uh, but still, the, the message here is that the, uh, the market is returning to some semblance of normalcy. We want to see, we want to see probably distress sales around 5 to 10 percent uh, to be considered normal. We're at about 20 percent now, um, statewide now. This doesn't take into account, uh, if you take a look at Sonoma, Marin, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, their distress sales are around 5 to 8 percent. So these markets have pretty much come back to normal. Whereas the Central Valley, some of those counties still are dealing with distressed property sales on the range of 30 percent or more. Um, and they still have a much, you know, much longer way to go in coming back to, back to normal. So um, um, in the next slide, what we're going to take a look at is kind of dissect, to your point, Noreen, dissect kind of non-distressed sales versus bank REO resales and uh, short, uh, short sales. Uh, the red is bank REO resales, where you really saw an impact of the Homeowners Bill of Rights was um, in the short sale uh, decline between December of 2012 and January 2013. So those were the properties that were being dual tracked. So uh, you had uh, properties that were going through foreclosure, properties going through a for foreclosure, uh, a short sale, and as soon as that law took effect, those short sales disappeared until that foreclosure process was going to be resolved before going forward again. So that's, um, that's one of, uh, uh, of the interesting impacts of the Homeowners Bill of Rights. So, um, but really what's driving the decline in both uh, short sales and bank REO real resales um, outside of the Homeowner Bill of Rights is the fact that there's just no distressed property sales coming through the pipeline anymore. So your notice of defaults are much lower, your notice of trustee sales are much lower. So naturally you're going to see uh, on the other side of that pipeline your distressed sales uh, becoming very low. On the flip side of that, your non-distressed sales are picking up nicely. What's interesting, though, in the, uh, the previous slide is that your total market sales are actually lower than they have been since 2008. So if we go backwards, if we go back to that slide, can we go back? Um, if we go back to that slide, you notice that March 2014 sales fell 13.3% from March 2013 and are at, uh, are at its lowest, levels, uh, lowest March level since before the crisis started. And your total sales are actually lower than they have been in several years. So why is that? If you're, if you're really in an economic recovery, so what's driving that, you know, what's driving that process? Well, your distressed property sales, which were the uh, purview of a lot of investors, and you know, large head funds have disappeared. So they have rapidly exited the marketplace. 
and they have uh, exited the market uh, marketplace for greener pastures because their return on investment is no longer there. So now you need to, to have backfill by your first time home buyers and your move up buyers, but there's no inventory. So builders need to show up with inventory and because the building process is two to three years, there's, they have really lagged the demand cycle of, of the housing market for move up buyers. But the problem that buyers are facing now is, afford is increasing affordability. Certainly in the Sonoma County, Marin, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, you've got housing prices that are at or above pre-bubble pre levels. Not in Sonoma County so much, and not in Marin County, but certainly on the, on the peninsula. So if you take a housing, your median home price in Sonoma County, for example, is 490000 If you put a down payment of 20%, you're looking at financing almost 400000 That payment is $2,000 a month plus property tax, $500 a month, that's $2,500. Your median income is $60,000. Your disposable median income is about $48,000 or $4,000 per month. You're looking at 62% of your disposable income going towards housing. So that's what's going to hold back the California housing market from going through a robust recovery, despite what's going on in the rest of the economy, is now you're dealing with affordability again. And so what is, you know, I'm a little concerned about the alchemy that might begin to sort of emerge around the affordability issue in terms of lending standards. Um, now with the Dodd-Frank bill, we do have the qualified mortgage rules that are pretty strict, but there's a lot of pressure now to sort of deal with that. If the market were left alone to adjust to uh, the fact that demand, uh, demand might begin to fall off without the investment activity, you'd see prices retreat a little bit. But, you know, other than a housing bubble collapse, I haven't seen yet when housing prices decrease in the face of economic growth. So, you know, that's a, that remains to be seen. It should be an interesting thing to watch as the, as the year, year develops. So the next slide takes a look at, uh, one more slide. The next slide takes a look at uh, market sales versus median prices. The black line there is your median price increases. And you can see from March 2012 through today, there's been a huge increase in median prices, and that's what's driving the difficulty in affordability. So finally, uh, my last slide takes a look at negative equity. In California, we're still dealing with a fairly high level of negative equity. 13.5% um, of California homeowners, or nearly 1.2 million, are underwater. And um, now that's, you know, that's changing every month with increases in price. The more rapidly prices increase, uh, the more homeowners are able to um, sell their existing homes and buy new ones. So that'll change throughout the year, but that's still, you know, that's, we're still not at a normal, uh, normal level. So with that, I'll open it up to questions, if you have questions. And, um, and that's a brief look at the housing market. I have zillions of, zillions of data, interesting data, like what, Blacks, you know, what Blackstone is doing, the hedge funds, and what Colony Financial is doing, the hedge funds, and the California marketplace, very interesting. <laughs> but I'll say that for another time. <laughs> Thank you. I have a feeling we could go on for hours on this issue. Um, and at some point, we probably should, because the housing market in California is so much a part of our economy that... It's a huge driver of economic growth. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, just a comment on the affordability issue. Um, here in Sonoma County, we've been dealing with affordable, affordability issues as long as I can remember. And I was appointed to the Planning Commission back in 1993, and instantly the first issue that I had to deal with was affordable housing. Yeah. And it has not gone away. <coughs> um, and usually, the pro well, the problem is twofold. Housing prices are high because we have a high standard of living here, mm -hmm. and it's very desirable to live here, and our median income is not high enough to be able to afford uh, housing here. Um, <clears throat> the other um, problem affecting affordability, particularly for first-time home buyers, is that many of them are graduating from college with enormous student loan debt. So they're spending 10% of their income already on student loan debt. They can't look at 62% <laughs> of their income on housing. That's their entire uh, net income. Um, so on the, <coughs> I have a, a couple of questions specifically with the Homeowners Bill of Rights. When you were talking about short sales, um, 
Does the Homeowner's Bill of Rights affect the number of short sales, either positively, negatively? Is there no, that was just a one-time, I think that was a one-time effect. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you just had a lot, the, the normal procedure was to, you know, go through the foreclosure process, and then if a, you know, a homeowner wanted to try a short sale, to try to go through, to go through. so banks would dual track that, because if, if the short sale didn't work, then they still could proceed with the, with the foreclosure process. Now they have to do it linear, linearly. So I think there was a one-time effect as all those dual tracking, dual tracking um, uh, programs were, you know, you know, reorganized or restructured um, to accommodate the law. So uh, I don't think that's a long-term, long-term effect. I think you know the finance companies have have uh, reorganized their pr procedures now to accommodate the law. So um, there was a big push prior to the implementation of the law for you know. Um, uh, banks to sort of, you know, wrap up whatever foreclosures they were that were in the pipeline before January 2013. And then my other question is, um, California is a non-judicial foreclosure state, which right. is one of the reasons I fought so hard to make sure we had some kind of baseline yeah. rules that that regulated how the foreclosure process works. Um, how does California now that we've passed the Homeowner Bill of Rights? How does California compare? or do we compare it all to those states that have judicial foreclosure processes? Well, judicial foreclosure processes in New Jersey, it's over a thousand days to foreclose. Wow. Okay. So, um, so California has been able to, I mean, if you want to get on with positive economic growth, you need to put this whole foreclosure process behind you. And, you know, the longer it drags on, the longer people can't get on with their lives, the longer they can't participate in economic activity. So California has been lucky in that way in the sense that, that there's been enough legislation sort of appearing at the right time to sort of protect homeowners, but at the same time getting this whole foreclosure pro process behind us so that we can move on towards you know, positive economic growth. And the housing market is, you know, is a huge part of the economy. By some measures, it's 25% you know, of, of total economic growth. So um, the quicker we get towards a more normal housing market, the better off the economy will, will be. All right, thank you very much. It's thank been uh, extremely interesting, and I have lots of other questions, but we'll have to move on, I'm afraid, in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna call our next panel up together regarding oversight and monitoring of Homeowners Bill of Rights implementation. We have Jill Habig, Special Assistant Attorney General, Office of Attorney General Kamala Harris. And we have Kent Chun, attorney with National Housing Law Project, and Jan Owen, Commissioner, Department of Business Oversight. So if each of you could make your presentation from where you're sitting, I'd appreciate that. And uh, we'll have the whole panel present and then we'll go to questions. Go ahead. Good morning. Oh. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Jill Habig. I'm the Special Assistant Attorney General for Attorney General Kamala Harris. Uh, thank you, Chair Evans, for inviting me to speak at today's hearing. And thank you, uh, Senator Yamada, as well. As you know, uh, combating the mortgage foreclosure crisis and fighting for California homeowners has been a priority for Attorney General Harris throughout her term. Uh, at the height of the foreclosure crisis, A.G. Harris created the Mortgage Fraud Strike Force in the Attorney General's office to investigate and prosecute misconduct at all stages of the mortgage process. And that strike force continues in operation today. Then, along with AGs across the country, A.G. Harris negotiated the National Mortgage Settlement, which has brought over $20 billion in relief to California homeowners from the largest five servicers. And, of course, she worked with partners in the legislature, like yourselves, to pass the Homeowner Bill of Rights, which took effect just over a year ago. So in the aftermath of these efforts, the AG's office has engaged in both new and continued initiatives to protect California consumers. So I'd like to discuss a few examples of those efforts, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, because the committee has recently, I believe last fall, heard from Professor Catherine Porter, whom A.G. Harris appointed to be the California Monitor of the National Mortgage Settlement, I won't go into too much detail about that program, except to note that that work is ongoing as well. So first, just to give a broad overview of what we and our partners are seeing, uh, we've seen a significant decline in the volume of mortgage-related complaints from homeowners. Uh, the California Monitor has reported that complaints have now dipped below 100 per month to that office, as opposed to the 350 per month 
that we were receiving a little more than a year ago. These numbers are also consistent with the number of complaints the AG's office receives directly. Our public inquiry unit, for example, received about 4,859 mortgage-related consumer complaints in the year 2012. In 2013, uh, PIU received 2,511 mortgage-related consumer complaints, so a decline of 48%. And then as of April 11th of this year, PIU has received just 444 mortgage-related consumer complaints. So if this figure is representative of the rest of the year, we estimate that PIU will receive approximately 1,650 complaints in 2014, which would be another 35% decline. So as we saw with the, with the property radar numbers, these numbers are encouraging, but more still must be done for those that are continuing to struggle. So many of our consumer assistance grantees, who I'll talk about in a minute, have reported that they continue to operate at full capacity. Uh, and that complaint volumes to clinic offices and legal services providers have generally remained constant. So that may be a reflection of the fact that these organizations remain in need of funding and resources to expand their own capacity to help homeowners. So I'm going to go through some of the things that AG Harris is doing to continue to help those that are still struggling through this process to keep their homes. With uh, $10 million, $10.4 million to be exact, available from the National Mortgage Settlement, the AG's office created two grant programs to support housing counselors and legal service providers across the state and build their capacity to serve local communities in need. Uh, the state bar is administ administering that grant program and has been an invaluable partner in that effort. The first of the two grant programs is called the Homeowner Bill of Rights Implementation Grant and Kent Chen, who is here today, is the, the representative of that grantee. That grant was launched in March of 2013, and the purpose was to ensure that all of the consumer-friendly aims of the Homeowner Bill of Rights were actually implemented and interpreted in a fair and reasonable manner in the court system when they were, at, when they were applying the law, and that individuals have meaningful access to justice to use a crucial component of the law, which is the private right of action. So to those ends, the grant has three main functions. One, extensive outreach designed to educate consumer protection lawyers. Two, partnership with legal aid and consumer lawyers to devise a litigation strategy to shape the overall development of HBOR. And then three, engagement of judges charged with adjudicating those disputes in court. So the $1 million grant supports an 18 to 24 month project by the National Housing Law Project, uh, Western Center on Law and Poverty, National Consumer Law Center, and Tenants Together, which we refer to collectively as the HBOR Collaborative. And as approved by the AG's office, NHLP and its partners identified multiple goals, such as providing high quality on-site trainings and webinars to consumer and housing attorneys, training more than 800 lawyers, uh, providing individual support in specific cases, uh, creating a library of litigation materials, and producing a report that analyzes HBOR's statewide impact and identifies compliance problems at the end of the grant period. As of this week, NHLP has reported substantial progress toward achieving those goals. Um, for example, they've responded to about 704 technical assistance requests from attorneys, and 447 of those requests have been specifically about the Homeowner Bill of Rights. So since uh, Mr. Chen is here with us today, I won't go into too much more detail about exactly what they're doing, but suffice it to say they've been, they've uh, produced amicus briefs in direct litigation, they've trained attorneys, uh, they estimate that they've trained about 1,500 individuals uh, since the inception of the grant through classes and technical assistance and a combination of other services. The second piece of the grant program is the Consumer Assistance Grant with $9.4 million worth of funding for housing counselors and legal services organizations. So the Consumer Assistance Grant is premised on the principle of what we called Housing Plus, which is to say that um, it, this, the Housing Plus approach acknowledges that families need a broad range of tools as they continue to grapple with the fallout of the foreclosure crisis. So while many families still need housing-specific foreclosure avoidance services, foreclosure prevention counseling or legal representation, they also need help with developing an individualized path to a solid financial footing and developing a strategy for long-term financial security. Uh, so applicants for this grant program design projects to help families along this path, taking a dynamic approach that addresses a family's entire financial footprint, including housing, assets, credit, debt, and bankruptcy. Based on recommendations from an expert panel, the AG's office awarded grants ranging from uh, $35,000 to $1.75 million to 21 lead organizations across the state in partnership 
with dozens of sub uh, grantees around the state. Nearly every county is represented uh, by at least one grantee, and I believe you have a map in your in the packet of exactly what the distribution is of grantees around the state, <laughs> and also a short description of all of the grantees' activities. But uh, much of their work has focused on underserved and disproportionately impacted populations, including agricultural workers, communities of color, the disabled, the elderly, immigrant communities, veterans, uh, rural homeowners, and active duty military. So for example, to give just a few uh, statistics, in the first six months of the program alone, the 21 grantees reported serving more than 100 military members, 214 disabled clients, and 683 elderly homeowners and tenants. Overall, just in the first six months of the grant, uh, grantees have served 5,209 uh, people across the state uh, and services have been provided in more than a dozen languages. Uh, we just received this week uh, new reports for the second six month period of the grant and we're still sorting through the exact numbers there but based on what we've seen so far we, uh, we expect that those numbers in the second six months are the same or even more in terms of number of clients served. Um, so our rough estimate is that those grantees have reached 10,000 or more uh, Californians directly through some form of one-on-one -on -one class assistance, um, other kinds of forums. So to give just a few examples of the kinds of outreach and services these grantees are providing, uh, for example, here in Sonoma and Marin counties, uh, Fair Housing of Marin, which received a $200,000 grant, has provided one-on-one -on -one foreclosure counseling services to more than 100 clients. Uh, one of those clients, for example, was an 80-year-old homeowner who was one year behind on his mortgage and on his mortgage payments and only surviving on Social Security income. FHOM contacted the client's lender to investigate homeowner bill of rights violations and identified instances of dual tracking and problems with securing a single point of contact. FHOM negotiated with the client's lender to stop the finalization of a sale date of the home and persuaded the lender to reopen the homeowner's case for reconsideration. That case is now with the lender's underwriting department. So that's just one example and I'm happy to go into more. Um, so overall, we're closely monitoring the data from both the California Monitor Program and from the grant program for trends and patterns uh, by any servicers that may warrant direct investigation by the AG's office. As it's just about halfway through the grant process and the amount of data collected is still uh, in its early stages, I, I'm not able to predict any specific outcomes of that effort as of yet, but that process is underway. And on a preliminary basis, we've heard from our grantees that they've had some problems um, in particular with some of the smaller servicers operating in the state as opposed to the larger servicers, and that too many servicers only start actively working with homeowners once legal services get involved. Um, on the flip side, the legal service prov providers that we talk to say that once they do get involved, servicers have been much more cooperative than they have been in the past. Uh, this is why we continue to believe that the public outreach and education of our grantees and of the Homeowner Bill of Rights grantee are really crucial to make sure that consumers continue to be informed of their rights and that the public awareness of the protections in involved in the Homeowner Bill of Rights are widely known. So many of our grantees have reported that borrowers are increasingly aware of the Homeowner Bill of Rights and their rights under the legislation and are aware of terms like dual tracking and things like that. So we're also working closely with the uh, H Board grantee to identify opportunities for the office to participate in ongoing litigation as an amicus in cases where we may be able to have some impact on the interpretation of the Homeowner Bill of Rights. A couple of cases um, we're looking at right now concern the availability, the availability of attorney's fees uh, when a case is still ongoing and uh, federal preemption issues that I, I think uh, Kent will talk about in a little bit more detail. And then finally, uh, beyond the grant program and the monitor program, the AG's office, of course, has its own in-house ongoing efforts to ensure the integrity of the mortgage servicing and foreclosure process. I unfortunately can't discuss any non-public investigations of the office, but in terms of information that is public, I can say that to date the office has focused on completing the national mortgage settlement compliance process and on participating in multi-state and federal negotiations with some of the smaller servicers who weren't part of the original settlement. Uh, the most recent example was the two billion dollar settlement with Aquin, whose loans represent approximately six percent of all underwater California loans. 
Uh, that settlement requires Aquin to pay $125 million to borrowers whose homes were foreclosed between 2009 and 2012, uh, provide $2 billion of relief over the next three years um, through principal reduction loan modifications, and adhere to servicing standards that are roughly equivalent to the national mortgage settlement. And we also have uh, mortgage fraud cases through our strike force. Uh, pursuing individuals who ran a statewide housing scheme using adverse possession, possession laws, for example, to fraudulently seize about 23 homes in, in nine counties. Um, we've pursued those who, start, who target struggling homeowners uh, with false and fraudulent services that are uh, designed to help them, they allege, but do not actually do so. Uh, and then, of course, we've recently reached a settlement with J.P. Morgan Chase, and our litigation with S&P is ongoing, and we've thus far uh, won each effort to dismiss that case, so discovery is, is now open. So, as you can see, we're, there are a lot of things going on, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I um, just want to comment that uh, Kamala Harris has been a hero uh, to a lot of people in trying to make sure that the uh, national settlement was strengthened. <clears throat> excuse me, from what it was originally <laughs> intended to be. Uh, and I think her efforts have paid off big time in that respect. There's obviously a lot to do, um, and she has only limited resources, but I, I just want to say keep up the good work, <laughs> and we are here to help. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a real delight to work with your office on the Homeowners' Bill of Rights. Uh, okay, we'll turn to Kent Chung, Attorney National Housing Law Project. We look forward to your comments. Hi, thank you, uh, Senator Evans, for inviting me to t testify. I'm uh, Kent Chan from National Housing Law Project. I'm an attorney there. I'm also uh, part of the uh, H-4 implementation grantee that, that uh, the Attorney General has graciously award awarded us. Um, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about how the HBOR cases have been doing the courts and what some of the barriers uh, borrowers face when they try to bring HBOR cases. So we generally track through both the technical assistance requests we receive from consumer attorneys and also we go into court dockets, try to monitor actively ourselves to see what cases are being brought um, in the courts and how those cases are decided. So we, do, we, we don't have a sense of all the cases that are brought. We, we do have an idea of cases that have received a preliminary injunction or they've uh, receive a, they, they receive a favorable outcome from the dispositive motion, such as demur or motion to dismiss. Um, that said, you know, we probably have at least, say, like one, one case a week where a homeowner, built, a homeowner has got a premium injunction or got a dispositive motion denied because uh, the judge found that there's a merit to the homeowner bill of rights case. And I think one judge even commented um, to me that before, before the homeowner rights was passed, it was so difficult seeing all these cases where borrowers had no viable claims. And now homeowner bill of rights does, now provides borrowers with, with actual viable legal claims to, to stop from the dual tracking practices and other practices that the, that the bill prohibits. And, but that said, you know, many of these cases are, are held by the homeowner bill of rights even if they don't receive a, a, a dispositive decision by the court. Um, in many cases, uh, are resolved even after TRO, where the bank just stops a, and the ba bank after TRO just voluntarily agrees to uh, rescind the sale or stop postpone the sale, or sometimes many cases are resolved before the case is even filed by the attorney sending a letter to the bank. So it's very difficult to come up with a, a real estimate or accurate estimate of how many people are actually helped by HBR because many of these cases are, are are resolved before um, they go into court or even before they receive a, a decision from a court. Um, most of these cases are, home and rights cases you might expect, are dual tracking, uh, on dual tracking claims. When uh, the, the servicer is moving forward with a foreclosure sale, even when there's a complete loan modification application pending. So they're either moving forward with a notice default or notice trustee sale. And most frequently, you know, when they're moving forward with a foreclosure sale and a homeowner has to go into court to obtain an injunction when everything else has failed. Um, but uh, single point of contact claims and the failure to receive, send acknowledgement letters so that the homeowner can actually 
um, supply any missing documents to make the application complete or do also make up a good portion of the majority of the rest of the claims. Um, most of the cases are filed before uh, a foreclosure sale. Um, very few of them have been, I've seen have been filed uh, after a foreclosure sale, but that, that may be a part of you know, the cases we do track, but that's um, a vast majority of cases are brought to just to stop a pending foreclosure sale. Um, in, the, in the cases, in, in these cases are mostly against the servicers. Uh, and, and there's a lot of advantages to naming only a servicer because it's, it's much easier to serve the servicer to, 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 for TRO purposes. Um, but some of the barriers that borrowers face is, um, while it's very easy for borrowers, I think generally easy for borrowers to obtain injunctive relief, in most cases when you go into state court, uh, when servicers are removed to some of the cases, the federal court especially, Wells Fargo cases, um, some of the federal courts and, and Wells Fargo asserts preemption, uh, federal preemption, especially HOLA preemption in a number of cases where HBR claims are brought. Some federal courts have found um, HBR to be pre preempted. We don't believe that's, um, that's necessarily accurate because Wells Fargo is a national bank but not a federal savings association. But um, courts have found HBR to be preempted as to federal savings associations. But state courts, um, preemption has, ne has generally not been an issue because state court, ca the case law in state courts have been much better in regard to preemption in that courts have found that HBOR only um, regulates foreclosure law and doesn't, um, doesn't directly regulate banking activities. So some, in some ways, I mean, borrowers don't necessarily understand this, but whether to succeed on HBR claims can depend on who the servicer is and what court they're litigating in front of. Um, courts, we, we haven't seen that many cases where attorney's fees have been awarded, and partly, as Jill have said, it's been sort of uncertainty in the courts whether attorney's fees can be afforded in the interim of a case where, where only a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction has been, has been issued. I mean, courts have been sort of divided on this issue. Uh, but generally speaking, I think court cases on HBR cases are resolved um, in an out-of-court out of settlement that, that may or may not, may not include attorney's fees as part of settlement. So there's very few court decisions on that, and hopefully we'll we might get a clarity on if a case goes on appeal uh, on these issues. The courts do re generally require bond to be posted uh, to, to get an injun preliminary injunction to stop a sale, and that the bond amounts uh, could be a barrier to, to borrowers to stop a sale, and that the amount of those bonds um, really vary in different courts across the state. Some, some bonds can be $1,000 or just posting the, the pending monthly payments into court. But other courts I've seen you know, go up to, up to $125,000 to just to stop a sale, which, you, as you can imagine, is a very big challenge for a borrower to post, especially it's not like a criminal bail where you can post uh, like 10% of the bond amount. They have to post the entire amount to just to get that injunction. Um, as I said before, you know, most of these cases are resolved out of court, so I, I, I don't know uh, how, how servicers, how these cases ultimately resolve in many of the cases. But I'm talking to attorneys, um, HBR, when they bring HBR cases, and, and especially if they get a gr favorable ruling from the court, these cases often receive favorable settlements from the servicer, at least to stop a pending sale and reevaluate the borrower for modification. Um, but it's, it's, all, it's hard to tell, but I mean, most of the cases are resolved fairly quickly um, between the borrower and servicer after a court ruling. And then uh, very few cases have been filed uh, post foreclosure sale, so it's hard to say. Um, what, any, if, any, if any economic damages have been awarded um, in those cases. Uh, 
one thing, one other thing I want to touch on is uh, the, the issue that I think you hear about from others. The, the one of the problems that people have enforcing HBR is the widow's orphans problem, where um, a, a daughter or son or spouse of a homeowner trying to enforce HBOR, and uh, I think I think a lot of some of the banks were respond have been responding that you know the HBOR doesn't cover them somehow because either that the borrower they are not the borrower uh, as as defined by the HBOR or that uh, the property is not somehow owner occupied, so um, that's a problem that we hope that can be addressed uh, through the le legislature. And another problem that some uh, borrowers have in enforcing HBR is when there's a H, um, single point of contact claim. And as how the legislation is written, um, some courts have interpreted the Spock statute to mean that the borrower has to specifically request a Spock to, for the Spock to essentially be a competent Spock, to, have, to, to be held to the standards that the uh, that the HBR requires to be to, res to be responsive to homeowners and know all the information that that uh, that a spot should have according to the statute, and that maybe there there could be a legislative fix to that spot issue too to not require to borrow or to specifically request one. Can you clarify something on that uh, point? Are courts interpreting it that the borrower must make a single request at any point during the process, or that the borrower must continuously request a single point of contact? The borrower must, I, th I think most courts interpret that to mean a borrower must, um, after they request a loss mitigation, after they send in a modification application, they must also request a SPOC. I think that, that probably just could just be a one-time request, yeah, but that must be as affirmatively requesting a SPOC and not just a loan mod. Thank you. Is that it? <laughs> oh, that, that's it, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank Excellent. you. Thank you very much. Very interesting follow-up questions that we'll get to later. Next, we have Jan Owen, who is uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Business Oversight. Welcome. Madam Chair, Assemblymember Yamada, can we hear right me? Into the oh, here we go. Is that better? Yeah, there you go. That's it? No, it's still not working. Uh, no, it's on. it's on. Hello? That's not it? Oh, oh it's better. Right. It's better. You just speak right into it. Of all people to have a problem speaking, I mean, really? <laughs> Madam Chair, Assemblymember Yamada, Ms. Newhall, and Ms. Kim, I'm Jan Owen, Commissioner for the California Department of Business Oversight. Thank you for the, um, uh, inviting me to speak today about the California Homeowner Bill of Rights. I'm going to start out, though, and tell you we have not found a good acronym to quickly <laughs> say Homeowner Bill of Rights. Jill just gave us one, HBOR. I kind of like it. <laughs> so if we start talking about HBOR, you'll know what we're talking about. The Department of Business Oversight license and regulates a variety of financial institutions, services, and professionals including those that play a large role in the mortgage lending marketplace. Under the jurisdiction, residential mortgage loans are arranged and serviced by four different law areas, state chartered banks, state chartered credit unions, the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act licensees, and California Finance Lenders Law. To scope that a little bit, we have 161 banks with over about $302 billion in assets. We have about 145 credit unions with $83 billion in assets. We have 357 residential mortgage lending act licensees that operate in 4,000 locations. And about. And you have established thousands, right? <laughs> you know that story. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> and finally, we have 183 California finance lenders, 
making residential mortgage real estate loans operating at 674 locations. In total, to give you, speaking of my staff of thousands, we have over 360,000 entities that we license and or regulate in, this, in the State Department of Business Oversight. The majority of those are broker-dealer, agent registrations, and investment advisors, but just to give you an idea and a scope. Um, we were asked to answer several questions, and I intend to, uh, to attempt to do that. Our predecessor departments, Department of Corporations and Department of Financial Institutions immediately dealt with the 175er issue that we all have talked about. We publicly posted information um, on our website and made the distinction between large and small mortgage loan servicers. The identity of those licensees above and below the 175 foreclosures is posted on our website, www.dbo.ca.gov. In calendar 2012, there were 20 mortgage servicers licensed and regulated that foreclosed on more than 175 properties. All of these licensees were under the jurisdiction of the former Department of Corporations. They were not banks, they were not credit unions. 19 of those had a license under, and the acronym is CRMLA, so the um, Residential Mortgage Lenders Act license, and one was under the Consumer Finance Lenders license. I'm gonna list all 20 of those because it's, it's interesting. Um, and they're, they're um, alphabetical. Bayview Loan Servicing, Carrington, City Mortgage, First Mortgage, GMAC Mortgage, Green Tree, Guild, Homeward, Aquan, Nation Star, Penny Mac, PHH Mortgage Corporation, Provident Funding, Residential Credit Solutions, Saxton, Select Portfolio Servicing, Satiris, Specialized Loan Servicing, SunTrust, and Veracrest, excuse me. All 20. According to our 2013 annual reports filed by businesses operating under both the CFL and the CRMLA, we have 10 companies in 2013 that have reported more than 175 foreclosures. City Mortgage, Champion Mortgage, which is Greenlight Loans or Nation Star, Aquan, Satiris, SunTrust, Guild, GMAC, Security One Lending, Reverse Mortgage Solutions, Carrington, and BSI Financial Services. Only one CFL license reported more than 175 foreclosures in 2013, and that's Nation Star. Failure to comply. Compliance with H4, God, I, I like that, thank you, Jill. <laughs> is assessed during the examination process and through the investigation in our offices of consumer complaints. In 2013, the department conducted 141 regulatory examinations of banks, 105 regulatory examinations of credit unions. During this process, again it was reported, neither the banks nor the credit unions identified any failure to comply. Within the Division of Corporations, the department performed 109 regulatory exams of lenders licensed under Residential Mortgage Lenders Act and 848 regulatory exams of lenders licensed under Consumer Finance Lenders Law. Violations most noted, licensee did not wait the required 30 days to file the notice of default. The licensee did not comply with loan modification process requirements 
And as reported earlier today, uh, single point of contact was not provided to the borrower. Disciplinary actions, what we can do. If a licensee is found to be non-compliant with H4, the how the department responds truly depends on the law in which they're operating. For CRMLA and consumer finance lenders, violations of HBAR are also included on the examination of report, or report of examination, excuse me. The licensee is responsible to correct the action and submit to the department the corrective actions that have been taken. Enforcement actions may be taken if a company does not comply with the requirements in the report or if the extent of the violations warrant administrative actions. If a bank or credit union is found to be non-compliant, they are cited for the violation of the law in, also in their report of examination and are required to also correct the violation, then inform the department of the actions taken. At a follow-up regulatory exam, the bank or credit union is reviewed for corrective correction of the violation. If the violation is still not corrected, civil money penalties may be assessed. If violations are found during investigations of a consumer complaint that comes through to our offices through our consumer hotline, such violations are noted and brought to the immediate attention of the licensee and corrective action is required. If not corrected, an enforcement action may be taken. Also, we can assess a special examination of the licensee, and we can review a broad, we can and do review a broader population of loans to de determine compliance. We are also working with other state and federal enforcement agencies on criminal matters involving companies operating in California. I'd like to give you some history, although our, st our numbers are fairly consistent with the AGs on trends on consumer complaints. Since 2010, the number of consumer complaints filed against residential mortgage lenders or servicers has decreased by over 50%. In 2013, the department received 565 complaints against mortgage banking licensees. More than half of these complaints were filed against 30% of the industry. There have been 103 complaints against department licensees specific to allegations of H4 since um, January 1st of 2013 to April 14th, 2014. Most of these complaints are related to lack of single point of contact and dual tracking violations. Of the 103 complaints, 50 have been closed. We still have 53 remaining open. And these issues are sent to the examination unit where the examination unit, when they go out for an exam, will go and make sure there's a resolution and policies and procedures that are in place that, that doesn't happen again. In an effort to provide our licensees with guidance on the provisions of, of HBOR, the, the former Department of Corporations released 65-FC on December 31 of 2012, which serves as compliance guidelines for the licensees. The release provides an explanation of HBOR as it applied to mortgage servicers with 175 or fewer foreclosures, mortgage servicers with more than 175 foreclosures, and the provisions that, became, that become operative on January 1 of 2018, and a summary of other foreclosure law changes in 2012. We also mailed notices to all of our licensees explaining this the new H4 as well. The former DFI's May 2013 monthly bulletin included information and articles about H4 and discussed the servicers with fewer than 175 foreclosures. 
It's very interesting to us that the we have not received any questions from our licensees about the provisions of the Homeowner's Bill of Rights. To ensure that the department has had the necessary tools to implement H4, the department's budget was augmented with five new corporations examiners and one attorney. No additional staff was provided or reassigned to the banking or credit union divisions. In working with the legislature and working with the AG's office, you know the commitment of the Department of Business Oversight and my commitment to fully implementing the provisions of H4. Um, I'm here to answer any questions and thank you for the opportunity. I also need to tell you, my mother used to work in Santa Rosa and I haven't been here since she retired. And thank you for having us here. It was a delight to drive by her office. Well, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here. And I appreciate your commitment to enforcing this law. Um, <clears throat> we are running behind, and I want to make sure that we can leave some time for public comment. So instead of a question, I'm just going to make a comment. Um, and perhaps you can fill me in a little bit later. Okay. I want to make sure that we are doing what we can to educate both judges, lawyers, and the public um, about what H4 is and what kinds of tools it provides to the homeowners, what kind of rules and regulations the servicers need to comply with, and particularly for judges, because this is somewhat new and California is a non-judicial foreclosure state. I want to make sure that judges understand the law. Um, and it was interesting to me, uh, Mr. Chen, you pointed out a couple of areas I think that perhaps should we, um, we should consider some clarification in the law. Uh, particularly with respect to attorney's fees, that was a hard-fought battle on that particular issue, and I didn't realize it was um, not clear, but my intention was that if the borrower prevails on certain things, such as an injunction during the process, that's when attorney's fees would be appropriate, but I can understand how judges are uh, having a little bit of difficulty understanding that clarification. So. Um, did you have any questions? Uh, yes, very quickly. Um, I wanted to just say that I'm a big data person, and so all of what you just reported, I hope we will be able to, if unless I missed it somewhere, um, get, get the data that all of you have reported. Um, the other uh, question that I would raise for, for a later <coughs> answer uh, is, you know, certainly looking at this map of where the uh, the hard-fought uh, grants were were um, awarded. Uh, has there been any definitive gathering of data on the disproportionate impact that this whole horn mortgage debacle uh, ha has inflicted upon a certain areas of the state? And I know in my former assembly district, uh, when I had the majority of Solano County, uh, Solano County was one of the hardest hit. So uh, again, for later uh, information purposes, I, I just wanted to know if, if there was any um, specific study or a gathering of information about um, where this ha has impacted the most. And that may have uh, been part of how you determined where the, the grants uh, were, were awarded. Yeah. So, right? Sure. Question, Assembly Member, <laughs> sure. for one moment. We have, uh, we have a series of data points that we're collecting from each of our grantees. Uh, to monitor uh, the, the clients that they're serving and what kinds of impact their services are having on the populations. We did account for hardest hit numbers when we were considering where to distribute funds across the state, so that certainly did enter into that calculation. And I'd be happy to provide you with additional background data on our grantees as we're collecting and monitoring that information. Great, and just one other uh thought to close this out is I noted in the uh, first speaker's presentation that the uh, time for the servicing issues to be dealt with seemed to favor those who owned homes of $500,000 or more uh, and the people who had, you know, a more middle class or uh, a, a different kind of beginning home stock, for example, were given less time to address um, their, their issues. And it just thought, you know, as we are wrestling in this country with all the issues of income inequality and so forth, that that just seemed patently unfair again. But anyway, just a thought. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, Senator Evans. And thank you to all of you, um, both for your ongoing work with H4 and for coming here today and presenting.
We appreciate it. I'm going to call down our next um, panel, which is the consumer perspectives. Lisa Sitkin, Karen Kelly, and Kevin Stein. And as they're coming down, I just have a brief announcement. We had intended to live stream this uh, hearing on my website, but because of technical difficulties, we are not able to live, live stream. So the um, entire hearing is being videotaped, and it will be posted on my website for later viewing, and I assume on Assemblymember Yamada's as well. So apologies to those who, those who had hoped to watch from home. Uh, okay, so our Consumer Perspectives panel, we are going to begin with Lisa Sitkin, Managing Attorney, Housing and Economics Rights Advocates. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, is this on? It's not on. We should push a button and speak right into it. Okay. Yes. That, I hear the reverb. Um, well, thank you very much, Senator Evans and Assemblywoman uh, Yamada for um, putting together this um, event and um, hearing about what's happening on the ground. Uh, I'm going to speak, I hope, relatively briefly. I want to leave time for um, one of our office's clients to, to talk about um, the experience that, that they've been having um, dealing, in this case, with um, Chase and the servicing of a, of a loan after um, the original borrower was deceased. So these are surviving family members. But first, I wanted to just speak a little bit generally, um, just in terms of overall impressions, and I'm not, I'm sorry, going to present hard data. It's anecdotal and impressionistic. Um, but I do this every day, uh, every week, so it, it does have some basis in the numbers. Um, I would say overall, uh, since H4 went into effect, um, we have seen a sort of general trend and improvement. It's hard always to tease out, you know, the economy's also been improving, so there have been lots of changes happening. I'm not a statistician, but I certainly think it's fair to attribute um, a good portion of the uh, improvement that we've been seeing um, in our day-to-day -day work with servicers and borrowers to the existence of HBOR. Um, for, for our purposes, and we are attorneys in my office, we're a nonprofit law firm. We work with other legal services attorneys. We do a lot of training and technical assistance for housing counselors who are working with borrowers. And um, what I would say um, has been sort of the biggest uh, benefit that we see is that we have now a structure and a set of rules um, that we can all look to together and, and you know, parse as needed. Um, and it does give us leverage that we did not have prior to the existence of H4 to deal with issues such as dual tracking um, and um, to some degree some SPOC issues as well and also how applications are handled, particularly in the appeal phase. Um, I would note that our office, um, although we were very much in the heat of the battle um, to get this passed, we have not actually brought an H4 case. Um, we have certainly spoken to many attorneys who have. We've provided technical assistance and advice. We've advised in some cases against bringing such cases. Um, but, and this was what I had hoped from this law, what I'm seeing as the greatest benefit is not that we're able to run to court all the time, but that we don't need to. Um, and that we're able, when there are problems, I'm not saying there aren't problems, there are problems. But we're able to resolve those before we would have to go to court because we are able to look to the law, point out where it may have been violated, and work out a pre-litigation settlement or resolution that doesn't require us to go to court. And to my mind, you know, in, ex in addition to sort of having a deterrent effect and improving overall, and there, there is better compliance, when there are problems, it gives us this sort of leverage and tool to work with. So, so that has been a real benefit. Um, I, I wanted to just make a note um, about the ways that H4 is actually stronger than uh, the new federal rules that just went into effect this year. There are ways that, that um, our state law and those federal rules overlap. There are ways that they diverge. Um, and uh, I just want to sort of emphasize that even though we now have this kind of federal, what, what even the people at the CFPB refer to as kind of a floor, a minimum set of standards for servicing across the country, 
um, that our state has not only been a leader, but been in many ways the strongest in, in affording protections to borrowers, and that's going to continue to be necessary even though we have these federal standards now in place. Because for just as an example, one of the big differences that comes up a lot in my work is that borrowers continue to be denied for assistance wrongfully. And in the Homeowner Bill of Rights, one of the things that is built into it is a 30-day period after you get a denial to review it and appeal it. And then some time even after that's denied before a sale can happen. It's extremely important. I can't tell you how many cases income is calculated wrong, documents. I mean, just yesterday, I had somebody who had told me at the servicer um, two weeks ago that my client had been denied for an in-house modification because they had what they call negative surplus income, which we might term a deficit. Um, <clears throat> but you always have to have these strange jargon. Uh, and I asked how much that amount was because I was trying to figure out she actually has some new income and I was trying to figure out, well, does it make sense to reapply now that she has changed circumstances? He came back to me yesterday and said when he went to find that number, he couldn't find it. And what he determined was that there was no negative surplus and that in fact she qualified and they had to re-review it. But that only happened because of this question. So uh, the point I'm making is there's a real need to have this appeal and the difference is that California affords a 30-day period, and the federal law actually only affords a 14. And both of these run from the date of the letter. They don't say, even if you have it sitting in your mailroom for five days, you know, you get an extension. So the 14-day period can amount to almost nothing for people. And sometimes it requires a back and forth to gather information. So I, that's, that's a great strength of our state law and one that, that we really want to see stay in place regardless of, of what's happening at the federal level. Another very important difference is that, and this is because the federal law is, you know, addressing states with wildly different foreclosure processes. Um, in California, we have a very specific sort of set of dual tracking protections that is specific to the way our process works. So if you have a complete application pending before a notice of default, they can't do that. If even after a notice of default, you submit the complete application, they can't do a notice of sale and then similarly before a sale. At the federal level, the only sort of end stop point is the sale itself, which means that under that law alone, if we didn't have the extra layer of the state law, um, we would see happening here what, what we were seeing before, which is that borrowers who were in this process of working toward, for example, a modification, uh, were having notices of sales recorded, sale dates hanging out over their heads. It's very anxiety producing. It also costs a lot because even if you get a modification, all of those thousands of dollars of attorney fees get folded into your loan. Um, and it also increases the risk that a sale can accidentally go forward. So in that regard, again, California really sort of goes above and beyond um, what the federal standards are. There, are. there are other differences, but those are a couple of the important ones. Um, I want to touch on some sort of widespread problems that we still continue to see. One which I don't think, um, or we haven't thought of a way at least, that, that HBOR or an amendment to it necessarily can address head on. Um, is that when there are servicing transfers, of which there have been many in, in recent years, um, with, for example, Bank of America offloading huge segments of its um, loan servicing portfolio to many different servicers, the Nation Stars, SPS, for example, um, there, the problems that arise and the mistakes that are made are constant. Um, this is an issue I would love for the legislature to look at. We're happy to work on brainstorming how we could address it. Um, it's been addressed to some extent in the federal rules, but, but again, I think not as, as um, strongly as, as is really needed. And just to give you a flavor of this, I mean, the kind of things that I've just seen, again, in the past week are we have a client who, in addition to dealing with the widows and orphans problem we'll talk about in a moment, at the very end of a two or three year saga um, in which she was horribly treated by her servicer, she finally got a modification. Just at that moment, her loan was transferred from B of A to NationStar, and um, 
It took a while for the paperwork, everything. She was still being treated as delinquent. It wasn't quite being recognized, but we got that resolved with a lot of care and attention and calling. And uh, a couple of months later, she got an escrow statement saying that her escrow payment for taxes and insurance was going up by $300 a month because she had an $18,000 deficit. And you know, we called immediately and said, what's going on? They said, oh, there's a deficit. And when they investigated further, it turned out that B of A had failed to transfer actually over $20,000 in a suspense account affiliated with her account over to NationStar. So you know, that's happened now. But that's an extreme version. But things happen all the time when people are midstream in modification process, whether they've gotten a modification. We've had people who signed a modification, got it back from the bank loan got transferred, next bank foreclosed. So these problems continue to plague borrowers in a, in, on a daily basis and, and something that, that still needs attention. Um, another problem that we see, and this is a place where I think that um, looking at the statutory language and tightening it up um, is called for, has to do with the standard of the complete application. As you know, um, the rights that are triggered uh, particularly against dual tracking in, the, in HBOR um, are triggered by submission of a complete loan modification application. Uh, at the time the bill was passed, there was this was another hard fought issue and unfortunately I don't think it came out the right way. Um, it was determined that discretion over what constituted a complete application would be left essentially to the discretion of the servicers. Um, and as we predicted, that has turned out not to be good for borrowers. Uh, there are other regimes. There is the HAMP program, and there are, in fact, the GSEs that set out clearly a list of what is required, basically an application form, some tax information, explanation of your hardship, and income verification, those four pieces. And what we see happening is that because the servicers continue to have discretion over calling you know, a complete or an incomplete application, often, and this is my interpretation, but I think it's correct, um, in order to not have that trigger go off, essentially, they continue to, they have sort of layers of review. One person looks at it and tells you a couple things are missing. You send those in, it goes to somebody else. They ask for a water bill instead of a PG&E bill or vice versa. Um, a lot of things that make no particular sense and, and don't seem useful. And while there are valid requests at times for explanation of differences on paychecks or income or things, I don't think that leaving it to the servicer to determine that not having that one explanation of a deduction on your paycheck should mean that you don't have the rights under this bill is a good way to go. Yeah. So if I, if I may interject, a uniform application across all servicers would be a benefit. I don't even think it needs to be a uniform application. I think it needs to be a uniform list of the specific components of an application. Because servicers are permitted to have their own application forms, I'm, I, I don't think we want to get into, nor do I think the state probably can, you know, telling them it has to be this form. But a uniform list of components that if the borrower sent in, even if things are asked for later, that wouldn't undo the fact that originally it was complete and that they triggered their rights under the bill. So, so that's, that still continues to be an issue. So I'm gonna to have to jump in because we're gonna to have to move on to the next speaker. Um, okay. I have a lot of questions, <laughs> so um, maybe you can hang around after and we can chat a little bit because okay. you're bringing up some very important issues but we do need to. If I could just summarize to introduce the next yes, speaker. Please. Um, the last issue that I'll say that, that is a gap in H4 and is a problem that continues to, to be very alive day after day and week after week is what we've referred to earlier as the widows and orphans issue. This is essentially a scenario where the only borrower named on a loan passes away. And his or her family members, whether it's a spouse or child or whoever is inheriting the property in whatever way, then um, enters this sort of Kafkaesque maze of not being able to get information about the count, of having problems getting reviewed. And um, one of our clients has come all the way up from Oakland today just to talk about the experience that, that this one family has had, and, and they are not alone um, with that kind of issue. So um, this is Corinne Kelly. She's here with her son, Ian and I'll let her tell her story. I appreciate that. And I had actually already noted that as being an item that we need to work on. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Is it talking here? 
try this one. Yeah, see right into the microphone. All righty. All righty. Um, my uh, ex-husband passed away July of 2013 of a long illness of cancer. And he placed his home, which was located uh, 2639 Maxwell Avenue in Oakland, uh, in a trust called the Gregory B. Kelly Living Trust. He made myself and my son Ian, our son Ian, a successor trustee. And Ian actually is the beneficiary uh, of the property upon his death. Uh, Greg and I were divorced over 15 years. However, as he became sick, I moved back into the home to care for him. And uh, I continue to live in the home with Ian. Um, the loan is actually under Chase, as was mentioned. And due to his illness and the length of his illness, he fell behind on his payments. Um, and Chase actually had given him assistance before his death and offered him a workout plan. Now, unfortunately, uh, Ian and I, we made four payments on that workout plan. And it, we just found it was just unable to afford it. So Chase pursued the foreclosure, and that sale date was actually December 2013. Uh, we had been trying to get reviewed for a loan modification and take over the loan since November, but they wouldn't speak to us. Um, as of today, Chase still has not completed the review process. We have been facing foreclosure month after month. Chase continues to delay the review process. Uh, the anxiety and stress is amazing having people uh, pull on your door, your doorknob, and knock on your door uh, until early evening. Uh, soon after uh, Greg died, uh, I consulted uh, with the uh, ACE Home Defenders League in Oakland who asked me to consult with the Housing and Economic Rights Advocate, HERA, and learned that we had a good chance on qualifying for a loan modification based on both of our incomes. Uh, with HERA's help, we submitted a loan modification to Chase November 21st. The application included uh, Gregory's death certificate, a uh, copy of the trust document, uh, the deed transferring the house into the trust, all the forms required for income documentation. It also included the authorization permitting uh, HERA to speak to Chase to discuss the account. After we submitted the loan modification, we received several letters uh, and calls telling us we had to send new third party authorization. We sent in the new authorization at least twice, and HERA prepared and sent Chase another third party authorization uh, in early December. Over the next several weeks, we tried to confirm with Chase that the authorization was received and try to find out the status of the application, but we could never reach an assigned specialist. Um, other representatives kept telling us that they did not have a valid authorization, they couldn't talk to either Hare or ourselves regarding the count. Some representatives said authorization had to be recent, and others should have said it was an ongoing delay process to provide something additional uh, in order to move the review process forward. Coming to early January, a Chase representative advised that the account notes showed several requests to review authorization, but no actual review. Uh, he said he would send another internal request for a review. After that call, Hera escalated the matter at Chase. Finally, on January 21st of 2014, two months after we submitted the initial applic application package, an assigned specialist returned the call to Hera and said that the authorization had been validated and that the application had been escalated on January 20th for an initial review. Okay, uh, she said that the process usually take five business days and she would follow up with relevant department to make sure the re review was completed. She said that, that we should not submit any other updated application materials until after uh, we received a letter confirming that we had been found eligible. We worked with Hera to update all of the application forms and materials so we would be ready to submit them soon as we got our eligibility confirmation. While we were waiting for Chase to complete the eligibility review, we received a notice of trustee sale set for February 13th of 2014. On January 31st of 2014, when Lisa Sitkin at Hera called and the assigned specialist, the specialist said that the file was still pending review. She said that she could not give an estimate 
when it would be completed. Another Chase representative told Ms. Sitkin that Chase was waiting for an updated income document. Since the assigned specialist has said we had to wait for eligib eligibility review to submit updated information, we thoroughly became confused. Throughout January and early February, we kept receiving confusing letters and forms from Chase, but we never received a letter about the eligibility determination. According to the online foreclosure information, the foreclosure sale on our home was rescheduled again for March 13. After all the delays and inconsistent information, Ian and I became extremely scared and we thought the foreclosure and we were about to be evicted. So we consulted a realtor uh, regarding a short sale in case the loan modification didn't work out. The realtor sent Chase documents about the short sale that was set for February 12th. He also spoke to an assigned specialist who told him that Chase didn't have any documents from us. That was not true. We sent completed financial information uh, November 2013. When Ms. Sitkin from HERA called Chase for an update on February 19, she was told that after they received the short sale document from the realtor, they canceled the modification review process and switched us over to a completely different department. We did not know that initi initiating the short sale process would interfere with the loan modification review. We just wanted to keep our home and, and we were just trying any avenue. We only started the short sale process because Chase was taking so long, they were making so many mistakes. We thought they would just sell the house and evict us. We told Chase we wanted to be reviewed for the loan modification and asked them to cancel the short sale. They said they would do that, but the short sale review ended up staying on for several more weeks. On March 5th, the assigned case specialist advised Ms. Sitkin of Hera that we would have to submit a new application in order to start the whole process all over again. She said that after we submitted the new application, Chase would review us for eligibility for assumption, the review that was supposed to happen back in late January, and then we would have to submit another updated application to be reviewed for a loan modification. Ms. Sitkin requested that Chase reopen our prior application and move forward with the eligibility review, but the case specialist said they wouldn't do it because they had already closed the previous review. We submitted a new application package on March 7th of 2014. After that, we were told that the short sale review would still be open, even though we had sent two letters asking them to close it in February. The regular case specialist was not available, but another representative said that she had been given incorrect information and that there was supposed to be some sort of financial interview before we submitted the application again. While this was going on, the house was still scheduled for foreclosure sale. People were still knocking on the door, interested in buying it, showed up, snooped around, pulled on the doorknobs all days of, and in the morning. Ms. Sitkin uh, at HERA made a lot of calls confirming that the sale date was postponed again, but it was really upsetting to have people coming around telling us that they were going to buy the house and wanted to know if we wanted to rent it. Chase finally closed the short sale review on March 16 and opened a new loan application review on March 18, 11 days after we sent the new application as they were told to us. On March 27, they told us that we were approved as, as eligible to take over the loan and told to submit another whole application package. We submitted a third application package on April 2, 2014. A week later, Chase told us that we needed to make changes to our homeowner's policy and also provide additional information about the title to the house. They could have given us that information back in November of 2013 or December 2013 at the least after they got our initial application, but they didn't tell us anything about any additional requirements until four months and two additional application packages later. They also asked for a form that we already provided them three different times. We submitted everything, Chase asked by April 15th. After that, they called with more questions about our income. We gave them additional information on April 17 of 2014. On April 22nd, we were told that our application was submitted to an underwriter for the first time. As of April 29th, it is still under review. In the meantime, Chase sent us confusing letters about the insurance policy they told us to change. So, then another thing we had to get worked out because it seems like the department doesn't talk to one another at all. It now has been over five months since we submitted our loan modification application with all of the required information and we basically are back to square one. 
We are told that the sell date is on hold, but it truly is hard to trust Chase after everything that has happened to us. And we don't know if or when Chase will actually review our application and give us a decision. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming here, uh, both of you. And you have all of our sympathies up here, <clears throat> both for your loss and for the um, difficult circumstances you find yourself in. Um, I can't tell you the number of homeowners and borrowers I have heard from that have had exactly the same story. Uh, I know misery loves company and that's, that's uh, cold comfort, <laughs> um, but it is, you've highlighted an issue I think that we have not addressed and that is how does the Homeowners Bill of Rights impact or apply to a successor in interest. So I, I, I'm so sorry that you're in the situation you're in. I hope for a happy ending and we appreciate your testimony. And Mr. Stein, I'm going to have to ask you to be very brief. We've used most of the time <laughs> we set aside for this. Okay, meeting. I'm, I'm so happy well to be brief. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Assemblymember Yamada. Um, so I'm Kevin Stein. I'm with the California Reinvestment Coalition. We're a coalition of 300 nonprofits throughout the state of California trying to increase access to credit and predatory financial practices and stop unnecessary foreclosures. A lot of our members are on the front lines of the foreclosure crisis. And I guess, well, first of all, and I will talk f for two minutes. I'll try and talk for two minutes. But I do want to thank um, the senator for her leadership so that we could be here today. And you mentioned Mr. Eng also, and the attorney general, and everyone who voted for the bill, which people, many people said would never pass. And it would certainly never pass with the private right of action, which is really, from our perspective, the heart of the bill. So I'm here to say that we appreciate it and that we think that we think that the bill is working and that people are in their homes as a result. Having said all that, you know, we of course, um, we hear there are many violations and we, we hear about the violations and you've heard testimony about the violations. The thing about the H4, which is so important, is that we think it has resulted in fewer abuses um, and where it has not, at least homeowners have a remedy. So they can go to court, they can seek injunctions, and you've heard that that's been successful. I th we have identified a number of gaps that I wanted to share with you, which I won't. The main, th the main point that I want to make is to reemphasize the point that's been made, which is a major gap which should not be is around the widows and orphans issue. So I appreciate that you're, you've written it down and you're interested in it. Um, it feels like an extremely pressing matter. There's been so much abuse and so much harm and so much suffering and it's, and it's hard to imagine that some people, and we think it is the case, are doing worse than everybody. Everybody's having a tough time, but some groups are doing worse and it shouldn't be that widows, orphans, and successors and in, in interest are part of that group. We really, th and you heard testimony from Ken Chen that the servicers are arguing that H4 doesn't apply in this situation, so we need, to, we need to close that gap, and we are very motivated to work with the legislature to close that gap. We would hope the industry would have no objection to protecting and providing some remedy for widows and orphans like those you've just heard to uh, be able to stay in their homes. So again, I thank you. Um, you know, maybe we'll submit uh, uh, something in writing to reflect uh, the concerns we still hear. Uh, you know, we're coming out with one of our surveys in the next few weeks that documents continuing problems with dual track and single point of uh, contact, but we don't want to lose sight of the fact that the H4 the, the is making a difference. It's important, and if we could um, address some of these issues, in particular the widows and orphans issues, it would really go a long way. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. And I would um, encourage you to submit something in writing. I would really appreciate that, and I think Assemblymember Yamada would as well, um, because neither one of us will be here next year, and if we want to get something done next year, we're going to have to work with some other folks who will be there, and um, your written remarks would be very helpful in that respect. You know, I was just going to make a comment also that we really appreciate hearing the direct testimony of, uh, uh, you know, family that's been put through quite a bit. And I would just go out on a limb and say if anyone from Chase is listening, I would uh, assume this case is going to be looked at immediately. Um, it just uh, seems uh, uh, just, just kind of a nightmare 
uh, to have to not only go through a, a personal loss, but then have to fight all of these other battles simultaneously. So um, I hope someone's listening. And thank you very much for uh, your testimony. I really appreciate it. Well, and that's been the nearly universal experience. Yes. Folks that find themselves in the middle of a foreclosure process are usually dealing with a whole lot of other things in their personal lives. Absolutely. And that's why I think um, everybody takes this so seriously mm -hmm. is because we understand you know, there's business to be done and services are human institutions and mistakes get made. That's, that happens. But the consequences in the lives of ordinary people are so severe, we have to take this very seriously. Well, and we'll also look out for the widowers. Uh, so yes, the widows, Don't widowers, guys, and orphans. There's two women here. We're thinking about you, too. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, we're going to call the, the final uh, panel together. Cynthia Negri and Mark Crawford, and this is the servicer perspective. And as they're coming down, I wanted to mention, we have two of the consultants here today who were instrumental in crafting and getting past the Homeowner's Bill of Rights. And I want to acknowledge the work that they did because we elected folks could not have done it without them. Eileen Newhall, who is the consultant for the Banking and Financial Institutions Committee, and Saskia Kim, who is the former uh, lead consultant for the Judiciary Committee. And we really appreciate the work that you both did. All right, we have uh, actually four people here, I guess. <laughs> and we're going to have to ask you to be very brief because uh, we are supposed to wrap up at noon, and I do want to have an opportunity for public comment. So uh, Cynthia Negri, we will start with you. Great, thank you for having me. Um, Chairwoman and member of the committee. I'm going to speak today on behalf of the credit union industry and Redwood Credit Union. Redwood Credit Union is headquartered here in Santa Rosa. Um, we serve about 232,000 members with 18 branches uh, in the North Bay. We have assets of about $2.3 billion. We've grown to be the 63rd largest of the 7,000 credit unions nationwide, and we are the third largest mortgage originator here in Sonoma County. Overall, 95 million U.S. consumers receive all or part of their financial services from the nation's 7,000 credit unions. Last year, credit unions experienced their fastest membership growth in 10 years, growing 1.3 million members. The credit union structure and historical performance of our mortgage loan portfolios strongly supported the 175 foreclosure servicer exemption from the Homeowner Bill of Rights. We appreciate that the legislature provided an exemption in the Homeowner Bill of Rights for servicers that can show a success rate of successfully keeping borrowers in their homes. As you know, the industry questioned the need to apply the age board, which looks very similar to the National Mortgage Settlement, to the credit unions. And as you're aware, even though no credit unions had more than 175 foreclosures in 2013, the legislature required parts of the Homeowner Bill of Rights to apply to the industry. In aggregate, credit union mortgage losses have never gone above 0.45%. What this demonstrates is that credit unions across the board make mortgage loans to their members that have the ability to repay them um, without having to be directed by the federal or state government to do so. As we implemented the changes brought about by the H4, we did indeed doubt the need to impose these types of new regulations on good players in the industry. Since 2008, the federal government has levied 180 new regulations on credit unions, and many of these regulations were aimed at Wall Street financial institutions, yet have the disproportionately negative effects on smaller financial institutions that have done the right thing for their borrowers. As far as Redwood Credit Union and some of the questions that were asked, um, I want to address those. We have had an increase in our compliance costs as a result of H4. Um, we incurred initial compliance costs related to the analysis of the legislation, as well as expenses related to <coughs> implementing the new compliance notices. The initial increases we were able to handle with existing staff, but it also had an impact on our ability to work on other priorities at the same time. And since implementation, we still continue to spend money to comply with the law. So in general, RCU has been already performed, we had already been performing the types of outreach required by the law. Um, therefore, we haven't changed a large portion of our existing borrower outreach practices. We have not seen an increase in the foreclosure timeline. However, that could simply reflect the low volume of foreclosures we've experienced and the attention that we pay to each and every one of our members. The level of difficulty to complete a non-judicial foreclosure has not increased drastically. 
However, the Homeowner Bill of Rights has increased the amount of documentation, tracking, and development of procedures that are required to stay in compliance with the regulation, which means there's a continued need for Redwood Credit Union to find resources and incur costs related to the age form. To address the committee's question about litigation, Redwood Credit Union has not been sued for any age form violations. So in conclusion, we believe the foreclosure problems h Borough was crafted to address were a primary cause by foreclosures um, on thousands of loans rather than an institution like Redwood that only had a handful. Again, I'd like to reiterate that RCU was doing the right thing for our borrowers before, during, and after the foreclosure crisis. Overall, the credit union industry is thankful that the legislature identified the differences between even the largest credit unions in the state and those banks that were subject to the National Mortgage Settlement. Regulatory burden is one of the prime reasons that there's a significant consolidation taking place in the community financial institution sector. Difficulties in maintaining high levels of member service in the face of increasing regulatory burden are undoubtedly a key reason that small credit unions merge into larger credit unions. Community-based financial institutions have an important mission to help consumers, which is why it is more critical than ever for the legislature to recognize the credit union difference. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I think you're here to ask questions. I'm just, yeah. if okay. they arise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so then we will move to Mr. Crawford, President, Chief Credit Officer at Exchange Bank. Oh. Madam Chair and Assembly Member, Madam Chair and Assembly Member, Kevin Gould of the California Bankers Association. Thank you so much for providing us with this forum and opportunity to testify. Pleased to have one of CBA's members here, uh, Exchange Bank, joined by Mark Crawford, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Credit Officer for Exchange Bank. Uh, we uh, certainly were deeply engaged in the negotiations uh, over the Homeowner Bill of Rights. And in fact, CBA, as you know, was, was supportive of several aspects, including tenants' rights and additional protections for those tenants that were subject to foreclosure, as well as a variety of other solutions dealing with local blight, uh, as well as uh, advanced fee scams uh, for loan modifications. We also want to take just a brief moment because there was one thing that, that hasn't yet been discussed, which is to acknowledge you for your leadership in trying to retroactively uh, get the state to uh, adjust its tax laws in conformity with federal tax laws. Uh, it has been very clear that principal reduction is a key component of arriving at an affordable payment. And in fact, as a consequence, uh, we see a great deal of principal reduction occurring both in short sale transactions as well as in loan modifications. Unfortunately, the state failed to comply last year with federal tax law, and we believe that that has significant consequences on taxpayers in the state of California. So we look forward to working with you to advance that solution forward. With that, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Mark Crawford. Thank you, and I Light hope off. this bill will off. stay on through the legislature and be retroactive to help our taxpayers. Mr. Crawford, welcome. You'll have to push the button to, yeah. Is it on now? Yeah. Speak directly into it. it I believe if the red light's off. Use this to, yeah, try this one. I think they've been having trouble with this one all day. I'm going to try this one. Oh, much better. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members uh, and other guests. Uh, and thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. As you said, uh, my, I am Mark Crawford. I'm an executive vice president uh, and the chief credit officer for the Exchange Bank, uh, which is headquartered here in Santa Rosa. And my comments will be very brief. Uh, I intended them to be brief, even uh, regardless of the fact that we're short of time. Uh, and I think the reason for that should be self-evident in a moment. Uh, Exchange Bank is a $1.8 billion community bank uh, with a loan portfolio totaling approximately $1.1 billion. We operate 18 full-service branches in Sonoma County and one in Placer County, as well as lending offices in Contra Costa and Santa Clara counties. Exchange Bank has deep roots in the communities we serve. Uh, founded in 1890, on May 1st, yesterday, the Exchange Bank celebrated its 124th anniversary. Part of Exchange Bank's legacy and culture involves a commitment to service in the communities where we live and work. The bank is a generous financial supporter of many organizations and worthy causes, and that same commitment is evident in our employees as community service is both valued and encouraged. Exchange Bank is an active lender for various commercial real estate product types, including office, retail, industrial, and multifamily. 
Uh, this sector comprises about 45% of our portfolio. Commercial loans to various business enterprises, including wineries, vineyards, and agriculture, total approximately 30% of our portfolio. The balance is comprised of single family first lien mortgages, second lien home equity lines of credit, and other consumer loans. And I'll uh, go into that in a little bit of detail. Uh, Exchange Bank is not a wholesale originator or purchaser of residential mortgage loans from outside our market footprint. We do not purchase mortgage loans from others. We do not service mortgage loans for others. We originate loans directly through our offices to our customers, uh, our customer base, and we service the loans that we originate and retain ourselves. So our approach to mortgage lending is not transactional. Uh, it is a component of our overall relationship with our customer base. At year end 2013, Exchange Bank had approximately $211 million outstanding in our first lien residential mortgage portfolio and approximately $82 million outstanding in our home equity lines of credit and closed end home equity loans. Due in large part to the relationship nature of Exchange Bank's residential lending, our portfolio has experienced nominal defaults over the last five years. At year end 2013, we had one single family mortgage loan that was delinquent 30 days or more in the entire portfolio. We do work with our customers to successfully restructure and modify loans to avoid foreclosure. In 2013, we restructured 15 first lien mortgage loans and 10 residential second lien mortgage loans. And over the prior five years, that's been about our run rate uh, annually for, uh, for modifications. Over the five year period going back to 2009 or 10, and we've averaged about 12.4 modifications on first liens a year and 8.2 modifications on second liens per year. Uh, and it was fascinating when I, when I looked at this. Uh, over that same five-year period, we foreclosed on only one residential mortgage property. We made foreclosure uh, prevention information. Uh, we make that available to our customers on our website and provide links to other information. Uh, uh, and useful resources, uh, information about the Keep Your Home California program and others uh, to, um, to help out our customers. Over the, over the last year, we completed two successful modifications with benefits from Keep Your Home California, uh, one using the Unemployment Mortgage Assistance Program and one using the Principal Reduction Program. So Exchange Bank has had a, a history of successfully modifying and avoiding foreclosure um, you know, these programs do provide additional resources to assist mortgage servicers and borrowers, and it's my belief that uh, they should serve to reduce the uh, incidence of foreclosure in California. Uh, the Homeowner's Bill of Rights, uh, to the extent that the Bill of Rights legislation required mortgage servicers to deal with borrowers in an open, transparent, and efficient manner, um, it really represents no additional burden on the exchange bank, as that is always and will continue to be. Uh, our practice and uh, we would consider that to be our, our minimum standard of service and we, we typically exceed that. That's all I have. Great, thank you. An impressive record, <laughs> both of you. I appreciate you coming down and testifying. Questions? Comments? Thank you for uh, being one who would do this regardless uh, and I think we need more of that, not less. All right, thank you very much. Now is the time uh, for public comment on our agenda, and I see Mr. DeWitt is already here and ready to go. <laughs> we have three um, microphones for public comment. If you would just step on up and please start with your name. And uh, we'll start with you, Mr. DeWitt. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Evans and Senator Yamada. Okay. Okay, assembly member. I was promoting you, ma'am, because you're here. It's a matter of respect. I wanted to say thank you. I appreciate that you've undertaken this hearing today. I wanted to say that I thank the Exchange Bank, Redwood Credit Union, and the other financial people for coming and talking about this important matter also. I uh, do not hold an account at either, so I'm speaking independently. I am a member of a credit union, and I believe that it is very good to support credit unions and small banking, community banking, I appreciate that this Homeowner's Bill of Rights has come forward 
And I wanted to ask you to keep in mind that it's very important to keep these small community-based financial institutions independent and locally based because they are more in tune with our local home buyers, home owners. I don't want to see any of these organizations merge into others. They may see it as better business, but from a community standpoint, it helps us to have them here as they are now. I'd also ask that in your um, work and your deliberations, you'd also keep in mind to protect borrowers and mortgage payers first and foremost, so they can stay in their homes as they work out their financial difficulties. This Homeowners Bill of Rights has been helping on that in some ways. It's very important that there be leniency for those paying off their homes as an important policy in the future because what we're dealing with right now is there's still a number of people having financial difficulties. The situation is there may be more financial difficulties ahead of us, both the short term and the long term. So I'm hoping that you'll keep in mind the small borrower, the small homeowner, those individuals who need to keep their homes. And the only way it's worked out is when government stepped in and said, hey, you need to step back these big banking agencies, all these people that were more about getting their final funding. So I'll leave on that note. Stay with the small folks. Help us all the way. Good luck to you in your future endeavors. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Always a pleasure to see you. Mr. Leonard. Hi, uh, 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 Senator uh, and, and uh, Chair Evans and Assemblymember Yamada uh, staff. Um, my name is Paul Leonard. I'm the California Director of the Center for Responsible Lending. I think uh, my colleagues of the other consumer representatives did an admirable job of laying out the key issues, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, rise to thank you, Senator Evans, for your leadership uh, in the creation of the Homeowners Bill of Rights. Um, I think it has made a huge difference. And um, just to sort of put a fine point on what Ms. Sitkin said, uh, Interestingly, the, uh, the, the fact that as a leading housing legal services advocate has not filed a single suit under the bill indicates that the bill has worked exactly the way we had hoped that it would, which is to bring particularly the big servicers into line, change their procedures, and provide uh, a degree of fairness and a, a effective evaluation for loan modifications that were exactly what we had hoped for. Um, uh, just one other, uh, two other quick points. I can't pass up the chance to agree uh, with, my, uh, with my colleague from the California Bankers Association about the critical importance of enacting uh, mortgage, uh, mortgage debt forgiveness, uh, retroactive legislation retroactively. Uh, the fact that folks during the national mortgage settlement when the banks were pr actively pursuing uh, principal reductions that those folks may face tax bills this year is really unconscionable in my view. Um, uh, second, um, I think the point about transfers is really important in making sure those mechanics work, but I wanted to raise and flag an issue going forward about the fact that there has been a huge scale of transfers to what are essentially state-regulated non-depository institutions. And so wanted to just flag that the Nation Stars and the Aquins, those, the primary regulators of those servicing-only institutions is our Department of Business Oversight. And so we need to take a look at what they're doing in their examinations and making sure that they're uh, doing an effective job when they're reviewing the performance of these institutions which are growing very, very rapidly here in California. Just huge exponential growth in their portfolios as a lot of the large depositories are offloading the servicing rights to the Nation Stars, the Aquins, and others. Um, and finally, uh, Keep Your Home California, I think, deserves to have continued uh, focus and attention. It provides a huge source of potential relief. I was, I was gratified to hear the Exchange Bank representative say they had closed a principal reduction loan, but there is still a huge, about a billion and a half dollars at last count, available to help Californians, uh, assist Californians, including up to $100,000 of principal reduction that can go directly to the financial institutions. It's a benefit to borrowers, but it can go to the financial institutions, and yet we have seen uh, not a sufficient demand to take advantage of the 700 and so million dollars that were allocated for principal reductions for Californians for low and moderate income households. So the state, the, clearly the original presentation provided uh, some sense of the variation in conditions, but the Central Valley, 
inland empire still have large percentages of folks who are underwater and could benefit from that assistance, and yet uh, that, that the money has been slow flowing out the door. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention on, uh, on this uh, hot summer day, uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. Hot summer day on May 2nd. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard. Any other members of the public wishing to speak? All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Assemblymember Yamada, your Jim final Lee comments? Lee, I, too, wanted to once again uh, thank Senator Evans for uh, her long years of advocacy and service. Uh, and we still have a few months remaining, so I'm sure we're going to be up to something. Uh, but just, a, just one final comment that, you know, as we know, home ownership is really one of the first steps to wealth creation in our society. And for, for us to, um, to be grappling with this issue, uh, on a continuing basis, you know, we know that HBOR uh, was a great start and we will be working on improvements, but it really is fundamental to uh, that American dream that I think we all share. And so um, having served four years on a select committee on homelessness on the assembly side, uh, all of these issues are interrelated, affordable housing uh, and really giving uh, everyone an even uh, playing field from which to uh, achieve uh, good things for the next generation. So again, thank you very much, uh, Senator Evans, for your leadership and look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you. And um, this has been a, uh, I think, a highly significant uh, piece of legislation, as I said in my opening comments, the first of its kind in the nation. And um, it's only had a year and a half to be in effect. Obviously, it's already starting to have an impact for the better. And I appreciate that. There's a few holes that we need to plug, obviously, and no doubt additional things will have to be tweaked as we move forward. I appreciate the support from my SB 439, which addresses the tax consequences of a short sale. Uh, I, too, share your horror when I found out that um, what was going to be happening this year and that there was a bill languishing in the legislature to address that. So um, with your support, we'll get it moved forward. and hopefully get it signed and give some relief to those taxpayers that found themselves in a short sale situation. <clears throat> For people who aren't aware, unfortunately under California tax law, if a homeowner um, does a short sale, the amount of loan that was forgiven is taxed as regular income. <laughs> so these homeowners are hit with a double whammy, which I think everybody universally agrees is not appropriate. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. I know some of you traveled from a long way. Uh, I appreciate all of your help, um, both in getting the Homeowners Bill of Rights enacted and in implementing it and in improving it as we go forward. And thank you very much for your participation today. And uh, with that, we're adjourned.